All right, guys, and welcome to the 15th episode of Lifting the Lid. In this episode, expect to find out how much Royal Marines get paid, what the hardest thing you'll do in your career is, and why being a good athlete doesn't necessarily mean you can coach. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome back to a Lifting the Lid this week. Lifting the Lid episode. It's been a while. It has been a while. We're on 16, 15. Well, they'll know because we will have announced it in the intro. Yeah, we, we'll, we filmed the intro after. <laughs> we haven't. We don't know yet. So, it's you're, a surprise. You're all, you're all for grabs here. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a myth busting episode today. Something we haven't done before, but um, effectively, I've because that is my echo chamber. Mm-hmm. I've come up with five sort of common myths I, I see in kind of the uh, the industry, if you like, on a sort of weekly or regular basis. And we're going to sort of go through them and start to debunk them. Um, Ed's going to be my sounding board for this one. Well, I have no skin in the game. Here, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I can just cast aspersions. Uh, as you do best. As, as and when I see fit. Yeah. And I will. Well, you know when they say stick to your strengths? <laughs> That's very much what Ed's doing today. Um, yeah. So I don't, we're not going to do the segments, are we not? No, we'll save them. Okay, cool. So for new listeners, uh, we usually have segments but we're leaving them just get straight into the chase this time actually i'm thinking of doing new segments oh, yeah. like not been okay. in the ones that we have but kind of adding to it and, Any then ideas? We, and, then, and then we can pick and choose as and when they're appropriate okay Any I'm, ideas I'm, I'm, to new segments? I'm opening the floor up to people right okay so if any of you have any ideas for segments get in touch get in the comments you can save me a lot of brain work, effectively. Yeah, yeah, you can do our work <laughs> for us. <That'd> <laughs> and, and then in return, you well may or may not get the credit for a new segment. So Yeah, well, that's it. Um, are we going to dive straight in, number one? Yes. So I've got five myths for everyone wondering. So uh, hopefully you kind of pick something up or at least find it semi-entertaining. So the first one is a fairly obvious one for me and you because we speak about it quite a lot. However... Weight training shouldn't be done in preparation for the Marines. Yeah, this is how so is this common. even still up for debate anymore? This is just so void now as an argument. It's it's why when I was training for the Marines, this was this was a, a thing. I remember seeing a video talking about the correlation between bench pressing and push ups, and being like, "Oh, if you want to get better at push ups, just do more push ups. Don't bench press because bench pressing is seen as that like vein, uh, vein sort of bodybuilder movement, isn't it? Doing chest day and that." That's it's just it's just so such an old fashioned yeah it's just so outdated now it's just like so how like kind of like linear do you have to be in your thinking to yeah. just assume that to get better at one thing you just have to do that one thing and you can't kind of like branch out from that I know it's like saying you know to get it's like saying to get better at squats if we take squats for example doing things like lunges and split squats and RDLs doesn't help that yeah. It just, like, it just it leaves no kind of room, no fertile ground for accessory movements, which was just obscene. It's just stupid. And overall strength anyway. I mean, Ben was talking about it on our... Remember we had Ben, uh, ben Simons on the podcast? Go and watch that one uh, if you haven't already. He was talking about the, the general sort of using bench press, for example, as a primer movement for the next day was to prime the nervous system uh, or to prime the nervous system for like... Some, some like something like squats, heavy squats, the next day uh, in the in the next part of the session because it can prime the nervous system to handle heavy load, but there's no associated fatigue with benching and squatting. Obviously, and it's a similar it's a similar kind of thing. Like if you want to really smash, for example, push ups, doing a heavy set of bench press at the start of your session might not be a bad idea because then push ups are going to feel mega fucking light, and those first twenty reps or whatever. Again, I probably feel pretty pretty easy. That's just one example of where you can utilize it. It's pretty. That's a pretty niche example. Obviously, just improving overall strength. If you want to improve, like so, strength as we hopefully people know this, but I, I don't think actually some people do, is the underlying bedrock of not getting injured. The stronger you are, the less injury prone you are. In order to, pr- to improve strength, you need to progressively over- overload it. How can you do that with bodyweight exercises? Anyone? Well, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's the crux of the argument, Anyone? isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, and, it's like, and then if you don't buy into that, well, it's kind of like, whose side are you on? Exercise science and, and like peer-reviewed research articles or jaded ex bootneck PTIs who are just so deep in their own confirmation bias they can't actually see light. They can't anymore. actually hear anything yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they've got like tunnel vision and ear muscles on. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, like, <laughs> might as well. He's mad, isn't it? And, and there's no telling him. But... It, also because I think the information is coming from obviously a younger 
person than them. They, they feel like it's like telling your older brother something, isn't it? They're like, yeah, cheers, mate. You leave your ego at the door. Well, exactly, but that, yeah, but that way they can't, can't, can they? No, one, not a lot of pe- bootnecks can do that. And also, <laughs> I think the biggest thing is confirmation bias because people who um, there's a couple of issues actually going on here, but the first one is probably confirmation bias where. You did something, it worked for you, you got in the Marines, so therefore everyone else should do the same thing. Obviously, that's not the case because people have different needs and requirements for their for their physical um, preparation. But the other thing I think is there's a big association with talking to someone you know as a Marine. So you talk to our mate who's a Marine, right? Mm. No offence, but I mean, he, <laughs> he wouldn't know how to write a tra- training program, right? No. Okay, but he is a Marine. And that association sometimes is, is enough. So people go, oh, he's a Marine, so he's fit. He must know how, how to get other people in, in shape. We're almost going Not, into another myth in itself now, aren't we? This well, idea yeah, correct, that kind yeah. of like your military pedigree in terms of where you sit uh, in your role in the military hmm. somehow kind of automatically makes you... Kind an of authority like, on fitness. An authority on exercise science or coaching. Yeah, and which it is just It couldn't be further from the truth. Well, exactly. But the issue is... As an authority, a, a perceived authority to people joining, that's huge. Like they'll just hang off every word. So the 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 thing that happens a lot with my conversations I have daily, kind of thing, is a recruiter who, again, might be a corporal in the in the Marines or whatever they're in, but has no background in, like you say, coaching or qualifications or whatever. Just has their own experience, and that's it. Will tell someone, oh, you should do X, Y, and Z because that's the work for me. And because again, they're an authority and they're the person taking them through. They'll just listen to that and, and that'll be completely blanket uh, advice. And yeah, they'll just hang on. This is, I've, I've named this. Oh, yeah. This is the, the Stephen Gerrard fallacy. This ah, is, yeah. We should probably talk about this. We should Stephen talk Gerard, about this. So, yeah, this yeah. is a good kind of like analogy to use, I think, yes, really, for yeah, people yeah. to understand. So, Stephen Gerrard, obviously, generational talent, widely regarded as kind of the best footballer in that like golden generation of England players by his peers. Right, great at football. Does that automatically mean he was great at coaching people to play football? Well, again, people assumed it was. Yeah, exactly. And it turns out he's pretty toilet. He was terrible. Uh, and you can see it wasn't like when he went to Villa on it, and he, yeah. and he completely fucked it. The same team managed by someone else who was a good coach, really, really well. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely flying, and it's like exactly. the, like the inverse of that, or the, yeah, yeah, the opposite of that. He's kind of like Jurgen Klopp, I guess. Yeah, so like still yeah. a professional footballer, played to a high level, still has experience, but never regarded as one of the great all-time footballers. Mm. Goes into coaching, and he's absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> one of the best who have ever lived. Yeah, and a lot of that is communicative, as in how do you communicate to people, and how do you get them on board with your philosophies and all that sort of stuff. And Jurgen Klopp's awesome at that. I've, people get behind him people galvanise behind him that's one thing I think the other thing is just the passion and love for the actual coaching of the game versus just the game it's yeah. a different thing isn't it well there's, there's a massive difference between being an athlete and being a coach yeah but we I think r- people... ride a fine line here though don't we Be- with our sort of viewpoint on here because you do have to have done so- like you have to have the ability to prove you can do what you say what you what you're telling other people to do? Yeah, I think you have to have credibility. Where do you draw the line with credibility? Because I don't think you have to have competed at the highest level. I just think you need to have you need to be familiar enough with your discipline or sport to be able to empathise with the athletes you're coaching. Yeah, you need to know what people are going through and know the challenges they're facing. Mm. But you don't necessarily have had to excel in, for like physical performance because that can be contingent on loads of different factors, genetic potential. Um, like conditions where, when you were coming up like there's so much so many things that can affect whether you got to the fucking top or not yeah that doesn't affect how good good a coach you're going to be but if you are a coach that's had some level of experience in that domain then you're probably going to be well placed to comment on some things and, and also you have that buy-in from the athlete or the, the person you're working, working with because you could be phenomenal at communicating you could be you know take James Smith mm. if he was coaching someone to join the Marines probably won't fucking listen to him because he hasn't been there yeah so if you bring this back specifically to the Marines now mm. where does the credibility lie is it misleading for someone to have never been a Marine to take people through Marine preparation where where, does your, where do your opinions lie on this 
I'm pretty mixed, to be honest, because I'm fairly relaxed about these kinds of things and I always kind of have been. Because there's a lot of gatekeeping yeah, I was, I was just stuff about to, I was isn't about to, really about what about I'm about. the G-bomb. There's yeah. a lot of gatekeeping in the military. Oh, so much. And I do think, again, like I said, you need a little bit of experience. So I think having never been a Marine or having never been in the military is a little bit mental. Um, I think if you've been in other parts of the military, then potentially, because you know kind of some of the challenges and some of the stuff is similar, but again, it's not that maybe that intense. I think if you've been in training, but come out of training before you passed out, That's an interesting there's an point. argument for that. I don't know. Again, maybe... I'd, I don't know whether, because again, I think actually you you can probably learn from your own failings and and inform people there. Well, certain individuals have have under, undergone and are going certain levels of military training, not necessarily marine, and made quite a lucrative business off the back of their failure. Yeah, but I don't think that's terrible, is what I'm saying, because I think when, I, I know from what I understand, like their product is pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, and again, if, you, if your product's good and it fucking works, the actual, my actual view on, on most of it is if your product works and you get results, it really doesn't matter. No. It is the truth of it. I mean, who who am I and who is anyone else to say who someone else should coach? It doesn't make any fucking difference. Like, if someone, if you can get your message across enough, enough to a point where someone takes it on, is consistent, is adherent, and sees a result, then fine. Yeah. That's what I actually think. I think there's a lot. It's easy to say, "Oh well, unless you were a bootnet PTI sergeant, then you shouldn't do anything." It's like that's mental. Yeah, that's bollocks. Because obviously, again, I've got no skin in the game, so yeah. I can say this. But from what I've heard, compared to other PTI courses elsewhere in the military, because the Marines are kind of quite, what's the word, hermetically sealed, yeah, and almost a bit kind of like trapped, trapped in the past. With <laughs> yeah, their, old fashioned. Some of their yeah, old fashioned, basically. Mm. Their PTI course doesn't necessarily mould individuals into great coaches. It just encompasses a lot of thrashing, effectively, well, which is more a re- reflection of the individual's athletic capability. Correct. But I think one of the things we've got to say is that this is all conjecture because neither of us have done the, the PTI course. But I would imagine, and I have I kind of heard and anecdotally, I kind of will know that a lot of it is around, like you say, what you can do physically and what you can handle physically and how many kind of... I mean, it is about giving group sessions. You're probably very, very good at that, to be honest. Mm. Your ability to give a session to a group and all that sort of stuff is probably very, very good. Um, I think your ability to go one-to-one with a client who is below par in terms of their abilities is probably the thing you sh- you'd struggle with because everyone who you're dealing with in, in a PTI capacity is going to be... At a, of a certain mindset, first of all, and of a certain physiological capability. That isn't true if you're going to go and PT someone in the general population. Yeah, yeah. I haven't really, well, I haven't really thought about that. Yeah, so everyone that they deal with who's at Limpston Commando mm. is already at a certain level physically and mentally, really, aren't they? Exactly. That, that's it. So they don't really have to come, overcome any kind of adherence or you know, motivation stuff. And if they do then that individual probably isn't right and they just fuck them off. So it's not like... So you're preaching to the choir, basically. And then if yeah. and then if you don't preach, you get fucked off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's it. So, <laughs> so I, think, not, well, it's, I, I don't think... That, I think there's a probably an element of the game of coaching which they don't maybe have only be, only because they don't need it. There's not like... They're not they're not training it, so... And that's fair. I, I also, I'm not, I'm not just trying to slag PTIs off here, by the way. I'm not trying to say that they're shit by any means. I'm just saying like... No, they're extremely good at what they do. Yeah. But... It's about realizing that you know just because they have that title, they're not like fucking be all end all, all seeing or like that. Yeah, don't like, rest not on deities. Your, yeah, don't rest on your laurels, basically. Yeah, don't yeah. hide behind. In the same way that I don't think any coach should just hide behind their qualifications or you've their still, past experience. Yeah, you've still got to back it up with the here and now. Mm, staying current and staying. I, I used to. Ha- I had people uh, like PTs in the gym. I used to PT at, out of who were extremely good coaches. And it wasn't because they had done it for 15 years. It's because they'd done it 15 years, but also had continued to educate themselves, continued to stay forefront of this, continued to spend their weekends doing a biomechanics course or whatever it was. And, and that is what actually pushes them to be a decent coach rather than just saying, well, you know, I did a fucking mechanics course, a biomechanics course 10 years ago, so I'm, I'm sound. Yeah, but by, like any mean? qualification, as soon as you attain that qualification, it's effectively outdated. 
Yeah, even more research is happening. Dude. Even more so with like exercise science because like it's such a kind of it's such a fruitful place for research at the minute. It's quite new as well. Every yeah, it's a relatively new discipline as well. So we're just learning all the time. So if you have a pretty like fixed mindset and you're like, oh, I know everything now. Yeah, because <laughs> I've completed it. Well, you haven't because you're immediately just going to become outdated in your views and your and your beliefs and your practices yeah and and it and it all depends on the population who you're working with i think because obviously the reason why there are a million different coaches out there and the reason why they've all got business is because they speak to a different per, a different avatar a different individual so some people need you to be really empathetic to, towards them mm. and need that kind of arm wrapped around and whatever some people just need to keep the ass some people just need program and they can fucking crack on and do what they do what they need to do so there's such a like there's so many different people you, you, you can work with and so it's not like a, a right or wrong it's a it's a good fit bad fit sort of thing yeah so what can people take away from that be more mindful when selecting which coach to work with perhaps well you could say that but i mean we, we started with weight training so well, well I would I say, know, we transgressed we, I know, we I know, went into I know. something else didn't we? i would say to bring it full circle i would say the thing people can um can take from this is if you are working with a coach or someone who's maybe d- giving you advice or whatever it is mm. and they aren't putting weight training in your program run yeah i like that two birds one stone that in it there you go so cool so use that as kind of like a litmus test and then have the mindfulness to think right this potentially isn't the right person for me yeah and obviously there's a caveat to that in terms of if, if you've told them you haven't got access to a gym then maybe that's okay but yeah <laughs> yeah don't, don't just deliberately try and trip them up <laughs> yeah. yeah mate so i won't be doing any resistance training yeah i hate that i fucking hate it and i haven't got a gym yeah, yeah. and yeah. i'm allergic to weights <laughs> allergic to metal i fucking got him yeah yeah got him programming me press ups you twat yeah there you go so that's your litmus test for coaching there we go perfect um next myth number two okay so myth number two is you get to choose what you do and where you go as a marine Ooh, yes so a lot of people will, will think oh because you're kind of there's again that, that level of status you <laughs> attach to marines um you would think oh well you get to choose where you go you've been through a really fucking hard course you've done whatever you've earned the right to be there um so it's like once you once you finish kind of like basic training, you just get given the keys to the city almost. Pretty much, and you're, yeah, like, yeah. Well, you're fucking, you're yeah. unreal. What do you, you, you want to do? <laughs> fucking, you just do it, mate. Helicopter sniper. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, and that could not be further from the truth. I think so. There's something that people often forget is that you're in the military, and so mm. you're at the whim of the fucking government, effectively. And so you're at the whim of a lot of people. Well, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> The, <laughs> the bottom of you bottom the, the, you're the bottom of the pile literally. So you'll go from <laughs> being the top of a top of the tree in training because you're like king squad whatever you you like revered in training, and then you go to your unit and you're now at the bottom of the tree, and so it's a bit of a weird dynamic. But um, come what comes what comes along with that is the the, the sort of fact that the needs of the service are always going to outweigh the needs of you and the individual. So if you want to go fucking helicopter sniper. And the service needs someone in drive as well, unfortunately. <laughs> You're probably going to be a driver. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, the organisation always comes before the individual. Yeah, and, and that's it's like part the of basis what you sign of up for. any great team, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's part and parcel of what you sign up for with the, within the military. And actually, yeah, it's part and parcel of any great team. And that probably it probably happens to a point in civilian life, but you probably have a bit more say over it. You could probably go to your boss in a, a civvy job and be like, look, I know, you know, I've. I've been given this job, but I really don't like it. You know, I feel like I could be better placed and give kind of a reasoned argument as to why you think you could be, and probably get, get, get listened to. In the military, you can't do that. No. It's a dictatorship. So you get given something, even if, if, if you don't like it, it's tough. Like that's, and it's one of the things that I don't think new, like the younger generation can wrap their head around because they've been pushed this narrative through TikTok and Instagram and all this shit that they're in ultimate control, which most of the, most of the time you kind of are with it, well, it, in kind of school, you work harder, you get better grades and all that sort of stuff. And, and so a lot of modern employers will listen to your um, your requests. But when you go into the military, it's a completely different mindset and the way of doing things. It can be a little bit hard to get get used to, which can come with a little bit of, um, of a pushback. Yeah, TikTok hasn't really set up the next generation very well for life in the military, has it? wonder why. 
It was almost like it was pushed by the Chinese government or something, innit? Yeah, almost as if like, they like, weaponised social media to completely yeah. subdue an entire generation in the West. Mm. So they couldn't serve effectively to their country. Mad that. That's wild. Uh, yeah, so that I think that is a is a common myth that I hear anyway. Do you have any input? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, it surprised me that you still get people coming to you saying that. To be honest, mm. so I mean, like, it's a military. What you you would think it would be obvious, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, like, that's one of the things that I would like. I, don't, I guess maybe people have watched too many films, but maybe you think you just get free reigns to the city once you finish training. That's where the that's where the pain starts. Well, pretty much. Well, the um, the thing is as well, if you take it to kind of an extreme example, and you had a war going on, and you got drafted for the war, and you just didn't fancy going. Then you yeah. can't really say no, unfortunately. Well, well, because then again, going back to my point of the organisation always comes above the individual. So if you go back to a, a, another footballing analogy, yeah, Alex Ferguson, famous for always basically culling personalities in his team, yeah, yeah. when they became bigger than the club. So as soon as Ronaldo started or Beckham, to get, yeah, as soon as Ronaldo or Beckham kind of became bigger than Manchester United, shipped off to Spain, yeah. Because go and live out your days in the sun. Because that then damages the integrity of the team. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of that was an issue as well when Ronaldo came back to Yeah. United. So it was like short term it worked, but like long term. Yeah, it da- was just, damages the team it dynamic. It was damaging the team dynamic because it was like, well, everyone just becomes too reliant on him and it's a cult of personality. Yeah. And so the actual person in charge, the manager, doesn't get the say that they need. Um, yeah, so in a marine context, if you've got someone in your unit or whatever who's making all these demands mm. and, and, and then superiors kind of succumb to them, then what, what you know, you can't what have that. What message does that what send to the rest? Send, yeah? So yeah, you well, dig that's... your heels in and get your own way when all, all the lads are going to do that then, aren't well, they? Well, I spanned that, <laughs> that the other day or the other week on a different lift than the lid actually of the guys who didn't take the jabs. Mm. Did I tell you about that? I don't know, I can't remember. The... Probably. <laughs> Well, there was we there was two two lads at um at my old unit who basically refused to take a certain vaccination inoculation jab. Uh, was it a COVID jab? No, no, no. On on the grounds that they were scared of needles. It was a jab you needed to go to Estonia. Bear in mind, you have a shitload of fucking jabs in training, so that was bollocks. But um, anyway, again, to linking back to you not having the choice to whatever way you want to go. They were about to get sent sent out to uh, the Baltics, uh, the Baltic states, to go and do this exercise. Didn't fancy it, and so the extent they went to was to refuse an inoculation that you needed to get, to, have mm. to get there, um, which was obviously met with horrendous oh, praise that. with um, biological warfare. Well, basically, within <laughs> in in house, yeah, uh, yeah. So that that sometimes is a little bit of a drawback of being in the military which was one of the reasons I actually probably pulled the pin on my career at the end was just because you have zero fucking control over your time no freedom of will no autonomy uh, which is not ideal at the best of times but it depends how much you you value that I guess but it's one of those things to think about if you're going to join if you're someone who thinks oh well you know when I can get when I get out of the out of the training part I can just do what I want probably not no. Yeah, so there you go. That's something tangible for you. Yeah. Before you join the military, uh, make sure that you're happy being told what to do indefinitely. Well, yeah. To a certain extent. For at least four years. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be indefinitely, but for at least a period of time. Um, if you completely reject authority or whatever it is, then probably not the career for you. It should be said, though, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, no, I know no. we're kind of like, we're kind of spoon fed like individualism in the West now aren't we and kind of mm. like the individuals should have like freedom of will mm. but there is something to be said for being kind of like forced to do things that make you uncomfortable because other time you just exist in your comfort zone and, and there's no growth there true true it depends on your personality I think if you're someone who's going to take yourself out of that comfort zone anyway then you can be okay you can probably grow without that true I think it's good for some people though yeah 100% yeah if you're if you're someone who probably needs a little bit more accountability and a little bit more motivation or whatever it is then yeah probably probably great for you and and, and it's a structure as well structure's huge mm. for, for people especially in that phase of life where you usually join like 18 to 20 years old there's a little bit of a vacuum of that structure in your in your in your life isn't there because yeah 
you don't really know what to do. It gives you clarity and like an end, not an end goal, but a direction that you're moving towards rather than, you know, most people when they're 18 to 24, you're wondering whether you should save for a house, whether you should travel, whether you should, there's all these questions you get going on yeah. in your head. It kind of removes that. And you're like, well, I'm in the military now, so I've got to just do what I've done told. Yeah. So there is an advantage to it for sure. Um, and even if you do hate it, you can think kind of like, well, short-term loss, I hate being told what to do now, but kind of like long-term gain of all the experience that I'm developing here yeah, that I can then take into later life whatever that might look like you know that's and you've got to just you got to frame it haven't you in whichever way is most beneficial for you definitely and the other thing is you in the moment are often a terrible indicator of what you in five years is going to want to have or is yeah. going to want to oh, do so bad so you might think oh well you know being in my comfort zone or or doing whatever it is you're, you're going to do in the next mm. couple of years is is productive and is good for you and is going to be great in the long term but it could be the case that you know, if you're in an environment like the military and someone's forcing you to do something, forcing you to go through these little crucibles of hardship, then in five years you might fucking thank them. It might be like, oh, well, this is this, that was a good good uh, good use of time. Yeah, exactly. Time, time is a great healer. So I was a pillock five years ago. Let's be honest. It's always in that psychology and money thing. Actually, the the book I'm going through at the moment is like he's talking about in relation to your um, job aspirations. He's like every single kid wants to be a farmer because you want to drive, drive a tractor. Mm. Everyone wants to drive a tractor when they're a kid. Yeah. But then you realise when you're a teenager, actually, it's not remunerated too much. So now you want to go and be a lawyer or something like that. Yeah. But then in five years, you realise, actually, ah, fucking hell, law school is a bit shit, isn't it? So then you, <laughs> you want to do something else. So like every kind of five years, your projection into what you want to do in five years' time probably changes. Um, it kind of matches where you are at that point in your life, I guess. Isn't it? Apparently, most kids now want to be YouTubers. That's yeah. like the most popular kind of like... Influencers, isn't it? Mm. That's it. It's bollocks that that is worrying. I mean I don't want to sound like a gammon but like that is, that's well, quite, is that is quite worrying isn't it it's not exactly well, it's not feasible for a start I mean no. I don't want to shit on the hopes and dreams of any younger viewers that we have but you know well, how does society can't function if everyone's just vlogging no because there's no plumbers <laughs> Cause yeah because they'll be they'll be vlogging that their toilet's blocked and there's no one there to fix it yeah because the, the bloke who they know used to be a plumber uh, just now, got 100k on TikTok he's, he's now just a podcaster <laughs> yeah I mean, pot, pot kettle black a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. But, oh well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, right. Um, myth number three. Okay, we're going to go... I'm going to drop one because we've covered a little bit of it. I'm not going to drop it, but I'll drop it to the end. Right. All right, okay. So, all boot necks and mm. nails in a scrap. Ooh. This is a hard one to prove, isn't it? We're going to stage this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like Brainiac, live science. Yeah, this is very much anecdotal, but uh, it's right. kind of, again something you would think of I I always used to and you you put your training team or put whoever it is on a, on a pedestal uh, and certainly think they're nails and there's different di- there's different definitions of what nails means right but I think you know being good at fighting is a completely different thing to being able to be wet and cold and fit there's a di- completely different thing so yeah. being a marine or getting certainly getting through marines training is the ability to withstand being wet and cold uh, and miserable and the ability to show some aggression sometimes and the ability to run and do push-ups basically that's it what? and so if you can do all those things it doesn't necessarily put you in a good state to be in a scrap <laughs> yeah okay yeah so obviously getting through basic training does build an incredible amount of kind of like mental and physical fortitude mm-hmm. in certain respects. Mm-hmm. That, again, in the same way that, you know, being a good athlete doesn't make you a good coach, being able to get through training doesn't then magically make you an amazing fighter, does it? No, exactly. Because if you actually haven't spent any time training to be a fighter, you can't chan- just switch it on. Chan- chances of you being a good fighter, probably pretty slim. You can't just crack it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that was always kind of something we, we spoke about actually in training where you, you would have because there is that association but you would have like two two periods two lessons of like RMCC which is like the fighting thing you would do the hand-to-hand really like, hand hand thing what what does that look like is it like grappling so it's a bit of both it's, it, a, a it's effectively coming to blow to blow with each other uh, not really in fairness it's more That's of a like shame. a distance management strategy so if you're super close to them they show you how to like submit someone and if, you, if you're uh, able then you're able you're whole objective of that is just to create enough space to draw your weapon to then use that because obviously 
Yeah. You, you've got a weapon, so why not use that? So it's pretty minimal. You say that's two sessions. It's about two in, sessions in eight months. Talk. Yeah. Well, probably about four, but you know. That's um, still minimal, isn't it, really? I, well, everyone, anyone who's ever done a martial art knows that you need to do it at least three days a week for years to, for it to be fucking an, anywhere near second so, nature. So where does this myth come from then? Is it that kind of like lads that end up in the Marines like scrapping anyway, you know, because they're of that persuasion. So they chose a career path that kind of advocates violence. Is that where it stemmed from? Maybe. I just think there's a... Or is it because... There's they a co- stereotype because there's they're all like masculine blokes who train and, you know, are fit, physically fit. So there's that... Well, let's cast the, the net a bit wider then. So like, to what extent are Marines like stereotypical alpha males? I think more so, but... Do you get any introverted Marines? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, you get you get everyone, every... All all manners of people you could imagine, you probably get them. Like Joker in Full Metal Jacket. Like he's, a, he's a journalist and also a soldier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you get, you get people who are, like, highly educated and just wanted a fucking challenge or whatever, and then they, they get through as well. But as long as, like... Against trite, but as long as they had the why to get through, mm. then they would do it, and and that doesn't mean they had to be super aggressive or whatever. And some people are just uh, are that stereotypical, you know, we're a fucking rugby player, and then they did whatever and went, yeah. went to. So some people are that, but not not everyone by any stretch of the imagination. Some people are like we had a, a guy called Swiss. I don't actually, he wasn't called Swiss at all. He was just. He was from Switzerland, so he called him Swiss. He was, he was, <laughs> he was nice. called, yeah, inventive. And he was like incredibly intellectual in terms of he spoke like fucking eight different, different languages. He would like write mm. on an evening and all that sort of stuff. And yes, he was an, anom- an anomaly, but yeah, it he, turns he, he was it turns out he's a Russian sleeper agent. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> man. Uh, but yeah, he was he was writing to Putin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So it's weird because he always kept asking our corporal for the nuclear codes, and we could never understand. So why. weird. I really don't know why. He did. And he kept then reci- reciting them in Russian on his way back to his grot. <laughs> really weird. But, uh, but anyway, he kept he kept ringing this bloke uh, in, a, in a place called the Kremlin. He's Vladimir, called, called his name Vladimir, was. Yeah. yeah. We never understand why. Yeah. He said he was his dad. But you know. uh, no. <laughs> so, sound like his dad. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Yeah. So there's there's just all all manner of people basically you would get in in the course so introverts extroverts alpha males not alpha males beta males you call them but i guess they're not they're not are they um <laughs> andrew tate podcast that's the, that's, the, that's, that's the opposite right and, and, and at what point in basic training do yeah. you get given your lamborghini <laughs> week, six, week 16 because otherwise what's the point yeah let's be honest week 16 is it what camoufl- color, is it camouflage what colors your corporal's bugatti yeah <laughs> yeah imagine yeah. that yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so that's um I mean I don't know. There's I don't know where the stereotype comes from to be honest of being either alpha male or being really good at fighting. I do think it's just associated with having done a hard course or something difficult, you know. Wouldn't you, surely the marines would should have an, the opposite of that stereotype though because they're supposedly kind of like the thinking soldier, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. But like, I think more it's probably exacerbated if you go towards the paras like the, you know, that's probably a, a more of a of an issue. Or but more like, of I, when I when I think of like the early commandos, you know, from like the Second World War, yeah, I always think of them very much as kind of like outliers and not stereotypical kind of like yeah, yeah, alpha yeah, yeah. soldiers. Yeah. But so obviously, like at some point, the the stereotypes kind of washed away there, hasn't it? And like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe figured itself into something else. Maybe there's, there's just a. There is a, like a, I watched that actually. I watched um, a Paul Smith clip, you know, where he talks to the audience, and he was talking to a, a guy who was in the Marines. He was like, "Fucking hell, you are then." That was his first thing he said, and it's a bit like that. That must be the init- the but, kind of initial. You might have a different thing because you're annoyed. obviously expo- <laughs> well, yeah, or exposed to exposed to a different side of the the boot neck, you know. Yeah, I get. I know what you what mean. What he means the- by hard is. Like, good in a fight, basically, don't they? Well, that's what well, I'm saying, yeah. Like, Marines are hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the sense that, you know, they have a lot of kind of, like, mental, mental grit. resilience. And they're obviously physically very robust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as we've stated, that does not translate into the ability well, to... Well, you put them in the f- ring with fucking Conor McGregor, they're probably not going <laughs> to not gonna do very well. No, exactly. <laughs> Someone like... What's his name? 
What's his name? That Tom. I, I was talking to you about him. Tom. Ke- uh, Tom Kennedy. No, he, he was on Chris Williamson the other week. Fuck knows. Uh, Tim Kennedy. That's it. Oh, he yeah. is a fucking I, beast. I know you don't like him because of his political views. Right, those. He has off. some. Right, those off. Political. He's views. a fucking monster. He's like number one of everyone in the fucking U.S. forces. He also. Was fourth in the UFC. Is he still serving? Fucking men's. Yeah, he's still serving in some capacity. Weird, kind of broad room capacity. But um, he was like special operations. Went into fight in the UFC. It's like <laughs> who the fuck does that? Uh, so he is a stereotypical alpha male, if you would if you would put it that way. But uh, again, yeah, this might not be everyone's a, the same. That it, might be a little bit inform the stereotype. Maybe people like that are, are forward facing. Jocko Willink from fact like. You know those people who. You, you this is see. right. See, this is what I think. I think now people project the stereotypical GI image onto British soldiers. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think that's that's changed in the post-war period. Cause, Probably. Because the British Tommy in the Second World War was always seen as very kind of like happy-go-lucky, plucky, like knobbly need, and it was always like the American GI. Yeah, it's true. Who was like more filled out, had like the like the fashionable uniform. Yeah, suave, Look the part. cool, yeah, kind of like stereotypical soldier. Yeah, and I yeah, think that, you're I probably think that, right. You're and probably I think right. that's it's, it's the, Ameri- the Americanization of British soldier stereotype. Yeah, disgusting. Well, there we go. Disgusting. I want our soldiers to be back British. None of this American shit. <laughs> bring Britain, bring Britain back. I, I didn't, make make don't, Britain get break great. Don't again. remember everyone asking me if I wanted GIs. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's what matters, isn't it? Where's my Tommy? <laughs> right, and he's gonna, he's got his World War Two hashtag right. knobbly knees. Let's get it trending. <laughs> bring them back, knobblies, <laughs> knobbly bobbly. Um, yeah, so that was my. Is that number three? Number number three. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it was number three. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Again, I don't really know where it's come from, but I do get that impression. I get that sometimes that um, conversation with certainly civilians who haven't had any experience mm. with yeah, Marines actually, in person. Well, so before we wrap this up, what kind of tangible advice can we give to the listeners? Scrap a Marine because they're not that hard. <laughs> no, I would actually say if you are a marine don't go around thinking you're fucking nails because you're not yeah that's, that's, that's a much that's more a one, yeah, yeah much more sensible spin there you go <laughs> that's, what, that's, gonna, what, that's what I'm here I was for. just going to encourage violence yeah so uh, yeah I'm that's I'm I'm very much the uh, the voice of reason yeah um, Quaker right that's why you left yeah but well, you need to come out and tell people that was the real reason why you left what's the reason you never joined because you were oh, you that? A pacifist yeah, yeah right yeah because exactly. I'm trans <laughs> <laughs> I know he's got some feelings on that. My real name's Edwina. <laughs> Curry. Yeah, she's dead. She's right? got it. Yeah, she's totally bitch. Uh, <laughs> yes, probably. Hopefully. Um, number four. Okay. Training, recruit training, is the hardest thing you'll do in your career. Me. Right. Oh, okay. Mm. So obviously I can yeah, shed well. no light on this yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not gone through training but so what is the hardest thing you do in your career well it depends what you do, you do in your career but I, w- I would argue Norway is probably harder um, there's a there's, there's certain physical pursuits you probably do that in terms of just, like low carries and stuff like that that's a unit that are, that are harder I found Norway harder than training I think certainly it's, it's different though actually because well, it's from, just not you, as long. You hate the fucking cold, don't you? Everyone hates that cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've it's never, mine, again, it, I, it's I, minus thirty. I don't it's know what I can add cold. to this because I've never been to Norway. Uh, mm. I, I haven't completed basic training. No. So, so, so again, like mo- I think most people, because it's pushed as it's like obviously front, front facing, isn't it? Training people. That's what that's that's the thing you think of if you think of oh, Marines. You think longest training in, the, in in NATO, or whatever, and so. That is, it just automatically go. Oh, that must be the hardest thing you do. You can't do anything harder than that. I think the idea of training is that it's harder than anything else. But we were talking to Jim, and he said being an Afghan was probably harder than training. And like, there's, there's probably there's, that's probably the case for most people who went to went to Afghan and did that kind of thing. I think. Um, I mean, like serving on the front line has to be the hardest thing like most people could ever do. Let yeah, alone, exactly, yeah. let alone serving in the military, like. Yeah. In all walks of life, like being at war, he's fucking horrible in it. Yeah, well, I can only imagine. Uh, again, we can't talk on that because we neither of us have been. Well, no, well, you, I don't think you, you necessarily have to go to war just to imagine how fucking horrible it is. You can just empathise with 
people who have spoken about shit like being in conflict. Yeah, like, I guess it's just, that's it's just like the like humanity is worst, isn't it? Yeah, you get to see some horrendous things. But for whatever reason, I mean, most people I speak to who've been to being in combat kind of yearn for it. I don't want to be back. That's, that's mad. I don't know. It's just it. Is it like it's adrenaline? It's that dren- adrenaline feeling you just don't get anywhere else. Isn't it? Where at what other point po- 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 of life would you feel that fucking that alive? Never. It's like a drug, though, isn't it? So it's oh, like yeah, 100%. they yearn for it, but it's not necessarily a good thing. No, and it probably isn't. You it's know, probably, the same way like rose tinted glasses as well, isn't it? It's probably like a little bit of that looking yeah. back on it and thinking, "Oh, that that was that was good," but I actually, don't really get the feeling of that was, you know, the horrible. Yeah, is it, or it, it could almost be like a form of like coping mechanism, almost. Yeah, you know, they've maybe, kind of yeah. like maybe told themselves that. Maybe. Again, like, I'm, I'm I, know, not, I, I get. <laughs> I do. I do. A lot I do, of caveats here because again, I'm not a qualified yeah. like, clinical psychologist, so I, I, I can't talk on how the human brain works either. No, I do receive that quite a lot though but I think there is a notion even if you don't go to war I think there's a notion that the, tra- the training will certainly like the commando test should we say will be the hardest thing you do in the, in, in, the, uh, in the whole process and I just d- disagree with that I think it's not not at all most people who well before we went on our Norway winter warfare course we were obviously getting guided through what was going to go what was going to go down and everyone who introduced it was going this was harder than training for, for us and like it, and it was for me as well so I think that it's a common it's a common thing and, th- and people would agree that that three week course you do in the fucking Arctic is probably a little harder than, than training certainly again certainly the commando test at end of training if we take like week to week because you've been built up for so long for that commando test week it's not even it's not actually the hardest thing in training <laughs> yeah right okay so from as an outsider looking in I look at like commando test week and think mm. that's got to be the like the worst thing you do in training. Yeah, it's not. No way. That's mad. Yeah. I get, but it makes sense when you explain it though, because like everything you do in training builds up to being able to pass those tests. Yeah, but, obviously, like, obviously the they're fucking it, horrendous. But we obviously, actually, when we did the episode on the commando test, we went through them like the start of the week, and then on X day mm. you do this, and then the following day you do that, and it's like the cumulative effect of all that in the same week sounds absolutely horrible. Yeah. Do we work out it's like 48 miles you cover or something mental? Yeah. Um, and like there's so little recovery time because you're still kind of like, when you get back, you're still like squaring admin away and stuff. And it's just like, mm. but that, I guess that's what it's built up to, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's a like lot you of the- You condition yourself to that. That's the whole point. It's, it's progressive like everything else. Like it's, you do the four mile speed march, the six mile speed march, and then you do the nine mile. And it's like, oh, well, you're just doing three more miles. And it's like- well, It's like everything. You take it out of context and it seems like- yeah, hundred percent. Impossible. It's the same with like people that run kind of like marathons in mental time. But mm. like, you don't, you only see the like, tip the of that finished, spear, yeah. You only see the finished product. Yeah. On the pedestal, you don't actually see the hours and hours and hours of dedication and practice that's gone into getting to that point. Hundred percent. And I, I think as well, um, th- there's so many moments in training that were like I can relate that were just fucking much worse than than those commando tests because the commando test week as well there's not much pressure on it it's actually deep it's actually not that like in terms of obviously the pressure to pass the test but around the test there's not much you're not doing anything you're not really getting screamed at and shouted at and all that sort of stuff you're not you know that it's very linear as well that you know that if you pass that then you you, you move on to the next thing whereas on an exercise you could do the entire exercise think you've done really well and you know the corporal seen you doing something wrong and then they, right. they pull you off so there's there's all those things that go on which make it harder mentally whereas you know on the fucking endurance course if you get get it done in 72 minutes you've passed so it's it's quite a quite a nice thing in that respect because that's not the case with with, I, with other things in training i guess it's a less the commando tests are a less like dynamic situation if that makes sense in yeah. that you have more direct control over the outcome 100%. compared to potentially like an exercise where there's a lot of moving parts shit loads going on and a lot to learn as well like learning learning curves super steep in, in exercise and in, in getting good at being a soldier right it's, it's a massive learning curve and so you're dealing with that while dealing with being under pressure while dealing with you know having to carry weight and there's a physical element as well whereas yeah just the, the commander test is just physical and you, you're done 
uh, and typically they're done in the morning then you finish for the day it's like it's not too bad really um, yeah. it, it's one of those things that again like look outside looking in you think that's got to be the hardest thing in training because it's the end thing and that's the thing you do to get your beret at the end but actually the period of time the probably violent entry or like which one of the key exercises or I would probably chalk it up to the first time you actually yomp with decent weight which is an exercise called Hunter's Moon which is like week 10 I think you've said this before, actually. Yeah, it was because it's not, it's like not horrendous weight in the grand scheme of things, but it's because it's the first time you've done it and you're yomping overnight and then you get like, you yomp for like, I don't know, it's like five hours. It feels like like forever. Get to this car park, get picked up by an SUV and you think, fucking hell, that's done. I'm sick. And then you're in this SUV thing or people carry or whatever it, whatever it is and you get dropped off just in the middle of Dartmoor. You don't know where the fuck you are. And then you've got another like six hours. It's horrendous. Do lads go back to Dartmoor uh, for leisure purposes after training or are they like scarred <laughs> mentally from it? I think most people are scarred. Because uh, it's imagine... a beautiful place. You know, assuming yeah. that you're not like yomping over it in pissing rain in the darkness. My my hesitant guess would be that lads who are still serving don't and lads who are out and live around there probably do. Right. Yeah. That would be my guess. Is it too much of a busman's holiday if you're yeah, still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're still in, probably too much of a... Because you just probably... As, as well, if you're living around there and you're based at one of the units around, you're probably using it for a training training area as well. Yeah. So it, it's probably something you'd want to give a miss <laughs> and go somewhere else. Right, so what tangible take-home can we uh, draw from that for people? What about giving people... Don't take things at face value. I like that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> what are you going to say? No, I haven't yeah. really got anything else. I can't add a lot to this. No, exactly. Yeah, so I, I was, uh, I was thinking just... It is, it's a good one, but unfortunately it's not something that I can cast versions about. I don't think... Which is a limiting factor. Well, yeah, exactly. Because so, I do that so well. I don't think there's much people can take from that, to be honest, other than the fact that sometimes the what you, what you kind of build up for something to be isn't, isn't necessarily the hardest thing. Sometimes you have to look a bit deeper and... Um, and figure out that actually there's there's a, a, another level before you even get to that point. Mm. I don't think l- lads shouldn't give themselves a hard time in training though. If they listen to this and they're like, oh well, you know, if they're really struggling and they're like, oh well, if I can't handle this, it's an even the hardest thing I'm going to do. Oh, that's don't a, be yeah, de- that's don't be point. demoralized by it. Yeah, see it as uh, an opportunity for growth. Well, focus it- on getting through this and then worry about that. Yeah after you've well, gone through training yeah and the thing is you're well equipped to to handle say a Norway after that like you're the reason you go through training is to curate that kind of mindset and, and way of thinking that you you are just well equipped to it and you have like things to fall back on like this wasn't as bad as when I did XX, XYZ whatever yeah but, so like objectively if you just picked it out randomly out of mm. context like Norway in your opinion is harder mm. but obviously because you again it's like you're building up to that point so when you actually reach it, yeah, it doesn't feel like it. Cause, no, because again, you're ready for it. Yeah, and also it's like it's different as well. You're not in a training environment. You know, there's there's no quitting or there's no there's not that that niggly thing mm. in the back of your mind of being like there's a block of green lid riding on this. Yeah, exactly. You've already yeah. got it at that point. You're already there, so it's different. But I just found it harder. Anyway, um, last is it last one? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. the one that you shunned, isn't it? Yeah, last one. So. You get paid extra as a bootneck. You actually get paid less than like regular infantry. I know you get paid the same. All right. Uh, Well, that is. I ain't gonna lie. That's bollocks. bollocks. That is bollocks. I mean, I have no skin in the game, so I can say this objectively. Bullshit. That is bollocks. Makes no sense at all. Really. Not trying to take anything away from the army. Yeah. But I'm thinking of people. I'm trying to shit on other like squaddies. Rifles. Yeah. Well, it's just a bit. It doesn't make any sense. Like any other job or role or whatever. You do more, and it's harder to do, so you get more. <laughs> like, yeah, why so isn't the, that a thing? So the training's harder. You there's more expectation on you. Yeah, day to day, you're more day at to risk. Day. You're more at risk. So yeah, like, obviously, like when because there's only like how many Royal Marines are there? Six thousand, like five and a half, six thousand. Yeah. Yeah, but because you're kind of like seen as elite, kind of like tier two soldiers, you're very much in high demand. So when we were fighting in Afghan and stuff, there'd always be. Royal Marines out on the ground fighting but because there's any on the front line yeah on the front line but because there's only 5,000 of you 
like the chances of it being you are a lot higher than yeah, if you're regular infantry. Yeah, you're probably, probably but you're getting paid there. the same amount. Even like this, you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to say, like yeah, it makes no there sense. should be an element of danger pay almost. I know you get paid more for being be, out yeah. there, yeah. but like the chances of you seeing combat as a marine versus someone, yeah, and you, and you get power pay, which meant. Which Ooh, meant what's to... this? Yeah, well, I've yeah. heard of this before. Yeah, you get parachute regiment, get extra pay. That's why Chadwick joined the corps, joined the paras. He always says because uh, to, to, he could have joined the infantry or the parachute regiment and chose the parachute regiment because it paid more. What was that? Bollocks. Yeah. Is it because they have to like be able to navigate parachutes? I think shit? it is that. Yeah. So like, uh, he must not be named on the podcast anymore. I could have shouted that before. For uh, he's got, <laughs> he gets power pay. Oh, he's yeah, he got his wings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, mad. You fucking got it all, mate. Um, yeah, so it's mad. I don't so, know why. I've got social media. Yeah. Well, you can't find him now. Yeah? So yeah. Might, <laughs> the, uh, but actually, mountain leaders used to get a fucking loads more ML pay. Um, but I think that's been that's been fucking kibosh. See, that's now, bollocks as well. Yeah. Because mountain leaders are fucking mental, aren't they? Uh, it's ridiculous. It's like, may as well be special forces, basically. Yeah, and if, you, if your job is basically to like live on the side of a mountain, like yeah. a fucking billy goat, like a fucking like, bar- barnacle. Yeah, yeah, literally, <laughs> <laughs> professional barnacle. <laughs> fucking suckered to the side of this like yeah cliff face. Like yeah, you get a bit extra, like, couple of hundred pound extra a month. Yes, yeah, so you can enjoy yourself when you're not on said cliff face. Yeah, yeah. Well, typically, there's the thing is, I mean, you obviously it, it is a bit mental that you don't get paid much, but. You don't really feel the strain, or certainly I didn't. I obviously didn't have many outgoings or whatever. But I think you know, especially if you're an ML, you're always out in fucking Norway. In Norway, you get paid a shit ton extra. Like so, you're getting a little bit of ML, ML pay, you're getting Norway pay as well. So you're always out there. So that probably uh, papers over the cracks a bit as well. Um, so the more it, like out and about you are, you pick up little bits of pay. Yes, yeah, so it's called LSA. So when you start your career, you're on zero days. Every, I think. Every time you spend more than seven days out, out of camp, you accrue days after that. So, if, you know, say you spend three months out in Norway, or whatever, you get 90 days, at, LSA. That builds up over your career. And you get banned. So if you've got, I don't know what the numbers are, but 350 will be banned two, and then 6,000 will be banned three. And um, what happens if you get to ban like six or whatever it is, you're getting 20 pound extra a day. So right, if you yeah. spend four months adds somewhere, up that. that adds up a lot, right? So that can happen. Then you get LOA, which is... Um, long overseas pay or allowance. Okay, so it's deceiving then. So like, if you can keep yourself busy, yeah. I don't know like the extent of control you have over that is a very little, negligible. Yeah. But like, if if you are away, you are getting paid more. It's yeah, kind of if you sat on camp like twiddling your thumbs, I guess, isn't it? That could be a bit shit. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, and then it, equally with that though, you could fucking save a shitload of money because everything's paid for, everything's subsidised, yeah. and, and obviously like, you're not, you won't be living much of a life. And but, it's, well, like you said, it's predominantly younger individuals anyway. Mm. So the chances are they've probably got like less kind Hanging of like responsibilities and overheads and stuff. Yeah, and so it's like, it's like everything in the public sector, though, isn't it? It's like you don't do it for the paycheck. You do, no, not you at do all, it for no. the fulfilment and like the honour of serving your country. Yeah, or just having the opportunities that are associated with that with the yeah. core. I think like the honour of kind of wearing the badge. Mm, yeah, exactly. A bit of that, I think, as well, and and just the a lot of people for, for a lot of people it's just the challenge and the fact they've they can continue to continuously challenge themselves in an environment that's going to support that. The um, yeah, like in Norway, like my first month in Norway, I earned like double what I used to do in the co- in the in the UK. Mad, it's fucking wild. So yeah. Um, you can earn a little bit more, but you just have to be busy, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Well, it's a tangible take home from that is kind of don't don't just look at the paycheck. You see the wider kind of holistic yeah. benefit package of kind of yeah, like, particularly if you're well, young. You always draw on the fact that like the experiences and the opportunities that you get in the military, kind of like doing shit. Mm. Yeah. What's that thing like? Oh, civilians would pay. Thousands yeah, so if you pay thousands for this, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does ring true to an extent, doesn't it? Yeah, well, we done... paid 200 quid for shooting in, <laughs> yeah, in, uh, in Austin. That would have been free, right? Or you've been paid for it. So the, it, it does ring a little bit true, and people laugh at it in the core, and it obviously is a, is a ridiculous saying. Um, you know, be getting thrashed or whatever. You'd be like, see, we pay thousands for this, lads. Um, it, it, which is stupid, but, but like, they actually do. But as a civilian, see, I can actually talk on this now because I am said civilian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've paid a significant amount of money to go to university. Mm. Uh, and not seen a fat lot for it other than a certificate yeah you know well, you, you're yeah. paid to do these things and get to then do them for free 
Yeah, there's definitely an element of um, of just thinking that it's, it's going to be there forever. Is is what I would I would put it. Out. I think if you're in the in the Marines because you're there and you think these opportunities just be there forever, then you don't tend to capitalise on them and you do complain about them and think fucking hell, I'm going to the range again today. It's like fuck's sake. Because yeah. it's 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 just the ubiquitous, norm. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and but my my mate who's rejoined from trucking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had a, a wheeler, we'll call him. Yeah, I had a friend. He might be listening in his truck if you are. Uh, so he had, he left the corps, had a bit of time as a civvy, rejoined, and because he's rejoined from civilian life, has a really different perspective on it, and he's just like he has operates with like gratitude with the shit he gets to do which is such a fucking better place to 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 come from and he what he, he was like telling me he's like new lads now will like call it dripping but like complain about stuff you're like i won't let won't have it he's like i won't let him he's like it shut is, the fuck up get away from it yeah me. like hindsight is a great thing isn't yeah it? having that perspective being like because if you just kind of straight out of school just from one institution mm. straight into another kind of similar kind of hierarchical institution mm. You don't have that perspective of being like, this is actually a great opportunity. And also, it's very fucking easy. So easy to not, to, to do the opposite and be like, oh, this is shit. Because everyone else is doing it and like everyone else is complaining. So it's easy to get on the bandwagon, not challenge it and just be like, oh, yeah, it's shit. Isn't it? like, and just get in that. Mm. We're British as well. Like, we, we love doing we love that. Sap- I'm guilty. Love of it. sapping. You love sapping. Oh, love- <laughs> and like, you know, and <laughs> at least so, I'm good at it. Well, exactly. And so, like, it's actually effortful and difficult to do the opposite and be like, actually, you know, we're fucking getting to do X, Y, and Z. And it's that frame of I get to versus I have to, in it? Um, right, I have to go to the range. Well, actually, you know, I get to go to the range and operate these ridiculous weapons that SF are coming down to show us or whatever it would be because it's a little bit cold. Just fucking stop moaning. Um, so yeah, you have loads of these stories, by the way, that like, all you forget about yourself. Oh, 100%. We'll be talking about something and then you'll kind of like... You'll stumble across a memory in the back of your mind and be like, "Oh yeah, we did like X, Y, and Z <laughs> when like I was like stationed at you yeah. know, so and so." And like you haven't even like thought about that for years. Nah, shit. Because just so much happens and you get to do so much stuff. Like, it does you... just like wallpaper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like it's in my mind there somewhere. And when you're having a conversation, it's like, "Oh yeah, we fucking did that." Uh, it is, and again, the more you can like anchor into those experiences when you're there and actually remember them <laughs> in five years' time rather than forget them like me, uh, the better the better time you'll have. And I think also, if you can be conscious that the, this probably opportunity or whatever isn't going to be there forever and you can actually put yourself forward for more stuff, it's probably a lot better. Like, it's a better place to come from rather than just like... Because, I mean, stuff will come through, like skiing in France for fucking two weeks or like adventure training in France for two weeks whatever you know it's like climbing and all that shit it'd be like 200 quid and lads would be like fucking 200 quid yeah fuck that I like get to, after miss my weekends like fuck that like are you fucking it's like, mental, you can't, like, like yeah. what you're doing I know, yeah I see what yeah. you mean but because you become so numb to it yeah, yeah because yeah, it's yeah. just your immediate environment and then everyone that you surround yourself with like you said is dripping about it like yeah. you sort of you need like a token civilian <laughs> to just be employed <laughs> uh, on actually, camp Actually, yeah. So the going rate for like a, a civilian <laughs> yeah. ski holiday at the minute, like according to like the latest statistics, yeah. Right? They try and do that, you know, when when you put your chit in, when you put your notice in to leave, they actually um, in, in they give you this little presentation. It's funny, um, and they price it up. So they price up being a civvy and being in the core because a lot of the objection they get is obviously you don't get paid enough. Yeah. So they go, okay. So this is your basic pay. This is how much you get in free gym membership this is how much you get in free dental free whatever and it's like 50k or whatever yeah and they add it up it's like 60k a year yeah. it's like they've chosen the most expensive gym membership ever private yeah, healthcare yeah. private they've dental they've cherry picked lots of exactly, the, yeah. the best gym is from this camp yeah. here like, <laughs> yeah. not... and, um, but it's quite funny because it, I mean it rings kind of true and they don't even put into it all the experiences and stuff you have you have, which you get um, but yeah so what, I can think... we, what can we encourage lads to do who are dripping in, in the core at the minute start journaling yeah practice nah, gratitude definitely. so if you're in training right so what you do is you want to turn up at Limpson with a nice big journal that you can write in every night that says things I'm grateful and for and then what you the want front. to do is you want to wake everyone up in the morning on the block with a big saucepan yeah. get them all on the landing get them all on the landing right guys we're going to practice our gratitude this morning yeah. 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 bottom get, field's cancelled get them all doing sun salutations before before the day starts <laughs> get them dancing around a maypole <laughs> yeah Singing so come by R. so don't do that <laughs> 
if anyone's actually going to take that serious. But uh, I would say, I would say, if you're, because it, it's probably more kind of prevalent and pertinent if you're in the court, if you're like at a unit, I'd imagine, mm. rather than like, like I was pretty, I was pretty good at this. Like he's not, he doesn't really complain too much, does he? No, but, he loves it. But exactly. again, he had that experience, so like relatively, he joined a bit later, didn't he? Yeah. So like uh, he yeah, had. Yeah. So like he had you. He went to university for a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He had like a civvy job where he's like a labourer. Yeah. So like he basically had perspective. It, yeah. He saw the other side mm. of the matrix basically. Exactly. So it probably helps. But I think if you're in training, it's normal to complain. I think that gets you through a little bit as well because it's shit. Oh, it, there is like, that kind of like shit. there's that shared hardship and like yeah, so it's just yeah. good to kind of like get it off your chest. Isn't it? It's like a form of kind of like bloke therapy. bloke therapy, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Yeah. You know it is. But I think if you're at a unit, just realise the opportunities you've got and try and capitalise them. Yeah. Because they won't be there forever. And if you leave in seven years, then you'll be like, oh, fucking hell. You know, I should have done a bit more. Yeah, like, uh, well, I'm envious of some of the shit you got to do. Yeah, exactly. it would yeah. cost me a fucking fortune. Yeah. Like, any of the <laughs> stuff we try and do that's, like, this me trying to, re like, feel my fucking marine background again. Cost, cost, cost you fucking loads I know of money. It does, yeah. Cost you shit loads of money, so. Yeah, so it's good. But, um, so tr- try not to... Actually, someone there... To finish on this, I guess this was told to us by our troop boss in training, and we were just about to do bottom field pass out. And we were you're on this thing called Cheeky Week where you do fucking about seven sessions of bottom field in a week. It's horrific. And it's not cheeky. It was, I, th- I thought you were going to say that it's like it's well, great because you, you do don't because do you don't do anything. No. So sort of like you're just kicked <laughs> no, no, back and relaxed. Absolutely, it's, it's ridiculous. So it's um it's nicknamed Cheeky Week. I think it's like yeah seven sessions about field whatever it's ridiculous but we were all sat in this fucking like broken men like <laughs> fucked and he's like lads obviously you know you've got your last session of the week tomorrow and you're all fucking thread as well like, right like yeah and he was like just realize that you know in seven years if you were asked to come and do a bottom field session you'd fucking jump at the chance he's like if i if i i can't do it do one now because i'm not allowed for health and safety or whatever like if i got offered that i'd be fucking loving it because it's a bit fizzy, it's like a bit different, all that sort of stuff. So just re- just have that perspective shift if you can. That this is something you kind of get to do rather than have to do, which is difficult to see when you're at the bottom of the fucking knife and you're absolutely hanging out. But it's a very good point, and it and it does ring true. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's what I'd finish on. That was five. That's it, isn't it? Good, Job mate. Done. Yeah, no, enjoyed that. Yeah, I that think was good. some good, solid again nuggets of useful information for people there yeah I agree always hopefully. providing again yeah, free well, trying yeah, don't fucking subscribe you cunt um, yeah the subscribers are actually going up aren't they yeah they are what are we on now on YouTube mm. we're on 1,380 I think ooh that's good that's pretty good trying it 2k by a year end year end well no well, before then okay let's get the let's get the bastards working <laughs> <laughs> yeah, click those buttons at home, you little click yeah, wombles. Move your fucking fingers. Get the click wombles going. Yeah, spot some bots like certain individuals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. No, anyway, anything to end on? No. Well, cool. there's, there are certain things, but I'll leave them because we'll be here for another hour. So are there? Okay. Yeah, I was going to talk about the role, the roles of drones in warfare, but uh, right, we can do a, we can do a ooh, separate podcast ooh, on that. Yeah, yeah, that's not a myth. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's certainly not a myth because I've seen. A lot of videos in yeah, Ukraine. You show me them. They're, they're <laughs> gopping. <so. laughs> yeah, so we'll talk about them on another episode. Yeah, overlay. They might be a reason to be cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Thanks yeah, for watching. We'll, yeah. And we'll see you next week. Don't know what the episode's going to be yet, but... I did, we didn't mention that because we haven't planned one. We might just look yeah. unprofessional. Yeah, well, you find out when we find out. <laughs>